Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Buchanan Kurzweil. I just recently uh, received a PhD from Boise State University, and I've been thoroughly enjoying these talks. I'd like to thank Ethan, too, for uh, filling in as a convener on short notice and running a flawless session, and for all the people and presenters and everybody in the audience. Um, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge high performance computing support from both Boise State University and um, ETHA and Zurich. Um, this work was funded by an NSF grant awarded to uh, Matt, Sarah, and Maureen, dubbed eFire. This was part of the GeoPrisms project. And also, much scientific discussion was had with uh, Philippe and Leticia and their students at Sorbonne University. So, a big thank you to them. And in in community, I'd like to respectfully offer this land acknowledgement to recognize Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people identify as Native Hawaiians. Malo. So I'll start the talk with a glossary of terms that I'll be using throughout to hopefully help the audience follow along that much better. Um, so markers refer to numerical objects that represent rock bodies in geodynamic simulations. Rocks are subduction-related samples with pressure temperature uh, estimates and other metadata. Recovery modes refer to regions in PT space with high sample density. So this is like the statistical mode. Um, PT is pressure temperature, HP is high pressure, and then OP and UP refer to the oceanic plate and um, the upper plate, respectively. This is a quick one-slide summary of the work. Here we're interested in understanding where rocks are recovered along a subduction zone interface shear zone. Um, also, how do recovery rates and distributions vary from different subduction zone settings? And then how do numerical and empirical PT distributions compare? What we find from our numerical experiments is that markers are overwhelmingly recovered uh, up to one gigapascal and that thermal gradients of the markers are strongly correlated with the oceanic plate age and upper plate thickness, while um, the depth of marker recovery is more strongly correlated with the convergence velocity. And most interestingly, we find that very, very few markers are detached from the highest density regions in PT space of natural samples. So we'll come back to the implications of these at the end of the talk. Uh, but first to set the context, we know that uh, very, very few rocks are recovered at all from subduction zones, but the rocks that are recovered are all recovered from the interface between the upper plate and the oceanic plate. We know quite a bit about the interface despite not being able to observe it directly. Uh, for example, we know that there's different deformation styles um, that depend strongly on the temperature and also the dehydration reactions going on in the oceanic crust. And uh, the interface also has unique seismic properties, which are characterized by these low velocity zones um, that have been imaged to be like on the order of a few kilometers thick. And they have uh, high VPVS ratios and high Poisson ratios, which makes them easy to identify. Uh, like this low velocity zone, for example, in red, uh, this is a seismic profile ac across the Cascadia subduction zone in North America. You can see this low velocity zone uh, sets kind of on top of the slab and terminates near the continental Moho. And while these geophysical, uh, geophysical images um, are, you can easily identify the low velocity uh, zones in these images, they really only hint at the internal uh, structure of the shear zone. So we don't get a lot of uh, great detail. But thankfully, there are a lot of rocks that are recovered from these shear zones that we can study in the field, and they do preserve exquisite detail on the millimeter to meters uh, kind of scales. For example, on the right is a photograph of uh, this beautiful outcrop in Syros, Greece, which shows this mixed ductile brittle deformation behavior where you have these weaker blue schist rocks kind of ductily conforming around more brittle um, eclogite uh, bodies. So you integrate all the geophysical data and the petrologic data, and you come up with these working models, both published in the same year, both really showing similar details. Um, and both of these illustrations are trying to point to, uh, uh, make the point rather that recovery is expected at or near these key rheologic transitions along the interface. And conversely, we don't expect rocks to be covered from certain areas as well. 
For example, we expect there to be an upper limit on rock recovery that corresponds with the depth of viscous coupling between the plates. Now, if we turn to the metamorphic rock record, here are two different uh, compilations of PT estimates from the literature on the left from Penniston Dorland et al. 2015 and on the right from Philippe Gard uh, et al. in 2018. We can see that natural samples, these are rocks that are, have pressure temperature determinations made on them that represent rocks that were recover recovered from these shear zones. And we can see that they're uh, distributed pretty smoothly across PT space which is somewhat contradictory to these models, working models that we have where we ex we're expecting high frequency of rock recovery from specific locations along the interface. So those specific locations are kind of outlined in the light gray regions there. And you can see that there are quite a few rocks that get recovered from around those regions, but there's also a lot of rocks that get recovered outside of those light gray regions as well. And so the petrologic record seems to suggest that recovery is sort of continuous along the interface rather than punctuated at specific uh, depths. And uh, it's really important um, in the context of these models to be able to um, put the shear zone rocks into the proper context to integrate them um, completely with the geophysical data. And in order to do that, um, in order to better understand the rates and distributions of rock recovery along the shear zone, we rely on the numerical models uh, published last year um, by myself and others, and uh, we trace and classify uh, something like 1.3 million markers over 64 numerical simulations to try to better understand where these rocks may be getting recovered from. Um, I don't have time to go too much into the model setup on the right, but the important thing to understand about these particular models is that the interface rheology is um, really controlled by the hydrologic model that we implement, which involves continuous dehydration of the slab and this formation of a weak antigorite layer, which you can see in the top diagram, it's that thin pink layer. So uh, recognizing rock recovery in these numerical simulations uh, characterizes an unsupervised classification problem because we don't actually know a priori which of these million markers are going to get subducted and which are going to get recovered. And um, so in order to automatically classify the markers as uh, either recovered or not recovered, uh, we wrote a classification algorithm that which essentially groups markers according to characteristics of their PT paths and then assigns them as either uh, recovered or not recovered. So on the left PT diagram, you can see uh, how the classification algorithm is grouping markers in the different uh, colors. And on the right, you can see how it's assigning uh, either recovered or not recovered. And note that the, um, the red shaded con or red, red filled contours represent the uh, Agard 2018 data set, while the green contours represent the distribution of the Penniston Dorland et al. 2015 data set. Um, this is a bit of a complicated slide. Uh, basically, if you take now just only the recovered markers, which are one, the ones we care about because those are the ones that, in theory, we can compare to natural samples, and we look at the, their distributions in PT space and we try to find correlations with respect to initial conditions, uh, namely the oceanic plate age, convergence velocity, and upper plate thickness, we do find many strong correlations and also many weak correlations. The stronger correlations are the ones you can see here that are uh, kind of filled more boldly. And uh, just to point out here that the important correlations that we find that I mentioned at the beginning are that the thermal gradients of the shear zone is strongly correlated with oceanic plate age and upper plate thickness, whereas the depth of recovery is more strongly correlated with convergence velocity. Maybe the most interesting finding out of this work is what we're calling the marker recovery gap. We see very, very few markers getting recovered from this region near two gigapascals and 500 degrees C, which also corresponds to the region of the highest density of natural samples. So we have a ton of blue schist rocks that have been collected from all over the place. A lot of them have a pressure temperature determination, maximum pressure temperature determination uh, right around two gigapascals and 500 degrees C, more or less. But basically, no matter what the initial conditions are, 
we don't see very many markers getting recovered from these areas. So on the very, very left PT diagram, um, you'll see the AGARD uh, 2018 distribution in red again, and the PD15 data set again in green. Those represent the natural samples. And then the black point cloud and then the blue Tanaka contours represent the recovered marker distribution. So that's the numerical data set. And um, although if you pay attention to how these, I'm gonna flip through a couple slides here, pay attention to how the blue contours change with respect to different initial conditions, we can see that rock recovery does change depending on how you set up your model. For example, slower slabs uh, tend to have deeper recovery um, than faster moving slabs. Thinner upper plates tend to have warmer thermal gradients on average than thicker upper plates do. Um, but no matter which models you see, uh, rather which models you choose, you can see this marker recovery gap kind of persists. And so in conclusion, uh, with respect to recovery depths, uh, we see that marker recovery modes uh, correspond really well with mechanical transitions inferred from seismic imaging studies, um, specifically underplating or possibly formation of tectonic melanges in these low velocity zones around one gigapascal, and then also perhaps a minor recovery near viscous coupling depths around 2.3 gigapascals. With respect to how recovery distributions change in different subduction zone settings, we see that markers show appreciable de deviations from the rock record, um, except for the youngest, slowest oceanic plates with the thinnest upper plates. If you are familiar with subduction zone settings, this uh, characterizes sort of a warm setting and may suggest that rocks are preferentially exhumed from warm subduction zone settings or that would be the case if uh, increasing average temperatures of markers, uh, well, we know from the distributions that simply increasing the average temperature of markers uh, does not fill in this marker recovery gap. Um, also recovery rates um, do not correlate with uh, age or velocity and recovery rates are also poor for thinner upper plates. So all of those points sort of contradict this notion that rocks are recovered preferentially from warm settings. And then with respect to the marker recovery gap, we think there's a few possible explanations. It could be poor implementation of detachment mechanisms in our models. Rocks, uh, pressure temperature determinations perhaps are systematically misinterpreted. Uh, perhaps rocks are resampled over and over again from this specific region, two gigapascals, 550 degrees C. And um, also perhaps rocks are uh, recovered early and or during short-lived tectonic events, and so do not represent this sort of steady state, uh, steady state subduction. And um, that's all I have for the talk. Thank you so much, and I think we have time for maybe a question. Thanks, Buchanan. It was a great talk, and we do have time for at least one question from the audience, perhaps. or from our online attendees. Joshua has a question. Please. Joshua, please go ahead. Please go ahead. unmute yourself. My apologies. I was just clapping my hands for Buchanan. OK, OK, OK. So, uh, yep. Did you have a, a question online, or are we? No, OK, then we'll go here. Thank you. Hi, uh, Emily Cooper Doc. I really enjoyed the talk. Can you just describe a little more detail what recovery means in your models? So where do we expect those rocks to actually be after they recovered? Yeah, thank you. I should have put that term in my glossary. Uh, recovery refers to the just the detachment of rocks um, from the downgoing slab. So recovery doesn't um, include exhumation. So this study, we're not here concerned about the retrograde path at all. Um, we're only concerned about the prograde path and where rocks are detached. And those rocks would represent the rocks that at least have some chance of making it back to the surface. And so those are the samples that are most comparable to the rocks that we do see um, on the surface. I hope that answered your question. And thanks for the um, claps, Josh. Good. Thanks very much, Buchanan. We'll move to our next talk.